I am Greg Ferris, and uh, you're about to witness a little snippet of uh, what that 40-year experience was like for me personally. Um, there, you will hear many opinions uh, from me as well, so, you know, always remember that what you hear uh, is an opinion of mine and maybe not based on actual facts. Uh, no, that's not true. I'll, I'll try to keep everything as factual as possible. Wow, this is really a good turnout, you know? I mean, the Belmont Stakes is happening right now. You could be watching a horse going for the Triple Crown, uh, but you're here, and I want to thank you for taking time out of uh, your busy pinball day uh, or video game day and, and joining me. So I had a, a previous slide up here, and uh, I changed it, but... We're going to get to that later. Um, if you were here early enough, you saw that slide. Um, and what I want to start with is first impressions. So uh, in pinball, uh, there's, there's a lot of first impressions that happen. And with the wonderful world of the internet now, first impressions can be misleading. Uh, and so um, we've, we've found this to be true because we release a photograph and find out, oh, they actually do like it once they play the game. So anyway, uh, without further ado, let's talk about these 40 colorful years that I've been through in the pinball business. Um, it starts with this wonderful timeline that I've created. Uh, and again, it's fr I, I stipulate it's from my perspective and my opinions are included. I am not by any stretch a historian of uh, the pinball uh, industry. Um, I never, never would... Uh, call myself a historian. I've just been in the middle of it all, uh, and uh, it's been a great career. So, um, like I said, I'm going to talk about first impressions, my first impressions of the game business, uh, people's first impressions of a pinball machine. We're going to get into that. And also, uh, before I got into the business, what made me vibrate? What, what was it about my life growing up as a kid that got me here. Because we all know, well, we all reach an age where we understand that life is not a straight line of plans that all follow through from one to the next thing. It's a serendipitous route. It's a, it's a serpentine route of things that you bump into, kind of like a pinball, and you find yourself somewhere and, and that's kind of, I want to get that out to the young people here because uh, the, y the younger folks uh, may not understand exactly how things were done back in the day. You know, they, kids always hear, oh yeah, back in the day. Well, you know, there really was a back in the day and we did things differently back then. So I'm also going to try to cover that. So uh, first impressions. So um, I could start by saying, the, the bar on this picture uh, was where my parents met uh, and, you know, or, or where they had a cocktail, let's say, uh, the night I was conceived. But that's not true. Um, it, it's, it's a bar, but the sign on the bar is intriguing because if I could read it with my glasses, it says, warm beer, lousy food, and ugly bartenders. So to me... That's a wonderful sign. That's a wonderful piece of marketing to have on the outside of your bar because a guy like me wants to see how ugly the bartenders are, how, how warm the beer really is, and how bad the food is. You know, it's, I, I want to see all that. So to me, um, that's a great first impression. So, um, and it goes back to the slide I had on here previously. If you walked up and saw that, you might say, whoa, what? What the heck is this all about? So we're, but we're going to get to that later. Um, also, uh, for me, the first impressions came in a bar much like that. Um, I used to go on vacation to Wisconsin. I'm from Chicago. Uh, and Chicago, there was no pinball in Chicago. We only made pinball in Chicago. But until 1978... Uh, pinball was banned in Chicago. So all around the suburbs, I didn't see pinball. I didn't get to play pinball until I went to, on vacation with my parents to Wisconsin. And it was in bars like that one I showed you that I would see um, pinball and pitching bats. And for me, my first impression of the coin-op industry was through pitching bats. I understood 
baseball. I understood that the ball gets pitched and you hit the ball and a home run happens or not. And that was easily understandable. When I played pinball, that was a whole different story. Uh, it, was, it was tough for me to understand as a kid what exactly was going on with a pinball machine. So before I got in the business, there was many other people in the business uh, before me uh, and, and guys that inspired me, uh, guys that I had no idea who they were uh, because nobody had notoriety back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. It was just guys doing cool stuff on back glasses and on play fields. And their artwork was based on simplicity, primary colors, a lot of geometry and interesting characters. This, uh, this was important back then because uh, there was a lot of, uh, excuse me just for a minute. There was a lot of uh, games being made back in those days because there was no competition for pinball. Uh, so these guys were cranking out art packages by the week and game designers were cranking out new designs by the week. So uh, they had to move quickly and they had to keep things simple. But they did an amazing job of keeping that simplicity interesting. So when Dennis and I got together and designed Wonelli, uh, Dennis said something very interesting about Roy Parker's work. He said, Greg, if you take a look at all of Roy Parker's work, everybody in that artwork is having fun. They're all smiling. They're all having a good time, and they're, they're, they're just having a good time. So he said that should translate then to the people that walk up to the machine for, again, that first impression to see, okay, if those people on the back glass and on the play field are having fun, I'm going to have fun by inserting a coin and playing this game. That's the theory, right? So... For a pinball artist, that first impression is getting a person to walk across the arcade and place their money in the game to, to play the game. Um, with Wonelli, now here's an interesting thing. I, I wrote at the bottom of Daisy May. So obviously, we were inspired by Daisy May when we created Wonelli. We didn't rip it off. We didn't lift it. We paid homage to a game that to me, it was really cool that was also paying homage to something else from that time. Uh, that game was made in July of uh, 1954. Hey, guess who was born in July of 1954? You know, so uh, there you go. Um, really weird that uh, the coincidence like that happened, but it, it was our inspiration to kickstart the Wonelli project. We, uh, we got some flack uh, from the internet when Stern released it and built it for us. I won't get into that. But in the, in the meantime, I spent some time trying to figure out how to make Wonelli a little more family friendly, even though I thought it already was, but that's just me. So I went in to sales and marketing. I said, hey, if you guys need a package that is totally family friendly, I think I got something. Uh, we haven't yet they haven't said yes to this, but I'm just showing it for the first time today just to have some fun because, again, it's Seattle where the seed for uh, Wonelli was planted. It's when Dennis and I were here in 2009, got back together, and, and, and so, so we take big juicy melons and turn that into huge ginormous melons. But now it's strictly about farming. It's strictly about raising the biggest melon you can and getting awarded for it. So, so this is just a really rough sketch that I showed sales and marketing and said, hey, I can do this. If, if we need to do this, if we need to create uh, a different kind of vibe for this game, it's totally doable and we could certainly pull this off. Um, so that's, that's the back last sketch that I did. And then um, it's probably hard for you to see some of this stuff on the play field, but I took out any kind of innuendo. Um, I kept things uh, uh, pretty, pretty family friendly and very family friendly, and, but still keeping the same vibe of the game. Um, I actually uh, put our fearless leader down at the bottom uh, with his famous huge, it's going to be huge. So, um, you know, that, that's uh, something... 
maybe we could see in the future, but I doubt it. So for me, uh, like I said, I didn't get to play pinball until I went to Wisconsin. But then it was later when I went to college where I really started discovering pinball. And this guy, Dave Christensen, was my inspiration. I was like, wow, there's people that are actually doing cool artwork on pinball machines. And this game, Wizard, was my first impression of, my first real impression of what pinball was about. Pinball graphics, the pinball feel, and the fact that the Who actually, you know, made a song about pinball was even cooler. So this is kind of a, a mind map of what what made me tick as a kid and what made me excited and 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 it you'll see how it leads into everything pinball so of course uh when i was about three years old elvis was just getting started and he was on tv and stuff and he inspired me as a three-year-old where my mom would make me get up in front of people and hey do your elvis and so as early as you know three years old i was entertaining, and I'll use quotation marks, uh, family and friends with my Elvis impersonation. Uh, drums, uh, I discovered drums in fourth grade at about the same time the Beatles hit. So I put uh, uh, Bringo signature Ludwig set there as another thing that really struck me and has stayed with me my whole life. Uh, cartoons, uh, I... I'm the youngest of four children, and I'm the youngest by nine years. So my older brother is 13 years older than me. So some people say I was a mistake. I mean, some people say I was the baby of the family, um, and uh, others, you know, use other names uh, for that. But anyway, um, being the youngest or being like an only child, I had a lot of time on my hands. And so... Uh, I was able to uh, spend a lot of time watching television, which was also another form of inspiration. Mad Magazine, I would go out, you know, by the time I got to be 12 or so, I'd go out and go to the drugstore and buy Mad Magazine. And my mom didn't know I was buying it. I brought it home and would hide it because if she saw it, she'd throw it right in the garbage. But, um, you know, I, again, totally inspired by Mad. Uh, Frankenstein, the, the, whole, the whole universal uh, monster thing. I think a lot of us can all, you know, share the same feel for, you know, all of this back in the day. Um, I still have my original Frankenstein Aurora model, uh, not in box. I built it and painted it fairly okay uh, back, back then. Three Stooges, big, big influence on me. Um, and, of course, the weirdos by Big Daddy Ed Roth and all those guys, the uh, huge inspiration. I, I made every model kit. I loved all that stuff. It was just so bizarre and so strange. And my mother would be like, can't you find something better to do with your time? And I'm like, I'm doing it right here. So anyway, and this guy down at the bottom, um, I'll introduce him later, that bug-eyed guy. Um, again, a break. So, this is an interesting, uh, another mind map that will take you further into where my brain started and how it developed towards pinball. So, in the lower uh, right-hand corner, it's, that's my mom. My mom is going to be 90, 98 years old this year. Um, up until she was about 90, which is when this picture was taken, she was still doing artwork every day. Um, I didn't know when I was a kid that my mom was an artist. She uh, was a photographer by the time I got to know her. And unfortunately, I was the subject of a lot of that photography. Uh, unwilling photography, mind you. Here, Greg, put this costume on. We're going to go out to the woods and take pictures. Great. Um, so uh, my mom was a huge inspiration, but I didn't know she was an artist. So uh, it wasn't until later that I found out that she had these mad skills. Now, the, the, 
the, here's the interesting thing. She has Alzheimer's. Uh, the pieces that are behind her are some of the last pieces she did with uh, fully developed Alzheimer's. Uh, and it's interesting to see her work. Um, some would say, well, it's really degraded from what she was capable of doing, but I see it differently. I see some really interesting, just, you know, simple shapes, going back to that simplistic design philosophy. And, and if you look at it the right way, it, it, it takes on a whole different uh, vibe of how she was starting to see things through the haze of both cataracts and Alzheimer's. But she was still determined to get that hand to do what she wanted it to do. So again, inspiring me up, up through, you know, current day. Um, the, the picture above that is, is a picture of a, a drawing from like a biology class. So my older sister was in high school when I was very little and she would bring these drawings home from biology class that were very intricate and stippled and it was what she saw in the microscope when she was looking through the microscope and I was like, wow, that's cool. You go to biology class and you can draw. And I never made the connection until much later that that inspired me to become an artist. It's like, I, I, I must like biology because I like to draw. So um, we'll learn more about that in a minute. This toy over on the left, um, that was the coolest Christmas present I could have ever received. My parents got me that. It was literally a light table. And who knew years later I'd be slaving over light tables like crazy, uh, tracing and drawing things for a living. Um, but that thing, it was a cartoon maker, and I could, I could mix and match, uh, you know, heads and bodies and, and draw whatever was on their, you know, cheat sheets that they gave you, or I could start making up my own stuff. So that, that toy would, like, you know, get retired and come back out of retirement and go back in retirement. It was just a, a great toy to have. Um, and it was more than a toy, really. Um, the Beatles, like I said earlier, the Beatles were a huge influence, not only on me, of course, on everybody, um, at least most everybody, uh, and and their their influence, their their uniqueness, uh, really stuck with me and, and made me realize that if you do something in art, you you can try to make it your own as best as you can. So um, I've 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 learned a lot from from that. Okay, the white rat. Here's an interesting story. My same sister that had biology class in high school got a job at GD Cyril. It's a drug company uh, because they were right down the street in Skokie, Illinois. And she got a job without any college credit uh, working in the biology lab there. And she worked on animals um, every day, uh, experimenting um, as she was told to do. Um, and one of the things that she had to do was castrate rats. Um, and she felt bad for them, but it was her job. And it was probably 1965 or something like that. So she went to work every day and experimented on animals, uh, not knowing exactly whether, where those experiments were leading to because she was just part of the cog in the machine. But she would bring home, she would sneak home a, a white rat that she had castrated. And uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, the castration process leads to a much larger animal. Um, so uh, I would have these uh, giant uh, white rats in my possession, and uh, they were they were fun to play with. Um, but uh, and that was before Willard, uh, so it wasn't weird. It wasn't weird at all. So anyway, just showing you more inspiration of where all this led to. So in a high school, so the young people that are out here, like I said. High school is what it is. You, you learn stuff. It's, it's important to do your work and stay focused and get to college and all that stuff. You know, it is important. Um, but when you're there, it sure doesn't feel important. So um, to me, art classes in high school were for burnouts, greasers, lowlifes, ne'er-do-wells, drug dealers, thugs, cheerleaders, and random strange rangers. Uh, and I apologize to any cheerleaders in the crowd. Um, but they, it was where people went to avoid taking real classes, in my opinion. So um, 
I didn't do that. I took algebra and trig and analytical geometry and a pre-calculus and biology. I took biology because, hey, I like to draw. And uh, physics and, uh, and chemistry and, and all that good stuff because I wanted to go to college. And I thought, well, if I like biology and I'm going to do something in college with biology, then I better take all these classes. So I did. But I also took band, orchestra, percussion lessons, and film study. Now, this film study it was intriguing because it, it, it brought out a different side of me that I wasn't quite aware was there. Uh, I just thought, wow, this could, this could be cool. So my biggest accomplishments in high school, ironically, were not through biology or chemistry or anything like that. My biggest accomplishments were I shot and edited an 8 millimeter film for film study and got a really good grade. Uh, I helped others shoot and edit 8 millimeter film projects uh, because they saw what I did and said, hey, can you help us do that? Yeah, I can. And I played in two rock and roll bands uh, for money. Now, that's the important part. A lot of people can play in rock and roll bands and never make a dime, but since sixth grade, I had been making money playing drums. So, um, you know, that's important because if you, if you choose an art, uh, you might want to make some money with it eventually. Um, so I try to tell that to my daughters. Uh, one of them got it and one of them didn't, but uh, she's doing just fine anyway. But I did like to draw in high school. I would go home. And on weekends, I would set up a still life. I'd throw an old gym shoe up there and a couple of other things and, and just spend my time uh, learning, teaching myself how to draw. So it did happen eventually. So now I got to college. And, you know, I'm, I'm all about the biology thing. The first two years, two years of four years, two years was in biology. I thought I was going to be pre-vet. I wanted to be a veterinarian because I wanted to help animals. I didn't want to experiment on them like my sister did. I wanted to help them and make them well again. Uh, but I found out a lot of things real quickly. Uh, and one of them uh, was, you know, once you go from studying single cell amoebas and planaria and all that fun stuff, now you have to start studying harder stuff like genetics. And... I, I learned that genetics was the weeding class. This is the class in college that you take to find out if you truly have what it takes to continue on in that field. And for me, genetics, the basic level genetics class was the weeding class for me. Uh, I had uh, an experiment with Drosophila, the famous fruit fly. Um, and, and I had to put the Drosophila in a jar and make sure it got enough ether in there to kill a bunch of them so I could look at them through a microscope and look at their vestigial wings or their red eyes or their white eyes. And my Drosophila group ended up all over the uh, lab. And uh, so I failed miserably on that experiment because I couldn't even get them under the microscope to do my job. So, so that didn't help anything. That was the first step of my uh, step towards not being a biology major. My second step is when I got pithed. I, sorry, when I got pithed. Um, actually, I didn't get pithed. The frog got pithed. So it, does anybody know what pithing is? All right. So I didn't know. And when they told us we had to do this maneuver right here, I was like, you're kidding me. And uh, this was unlike something that my sister did back in, you know, professionally. Uh, and, and I hated it. I hated it. I had to do it. We did it. And, it. and you learned about the nervous system and, you know, the anatomy of the brain and yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, that was the second step that started me thinking maybe biology is not for me. And the third step, the, the third shoe to drop, so to speak, was when we came into biology lab and we got this proposed to us. Do we have any volunteers? And everybody was like, 
uh, no. And uh, so we were like, uh, why? Why? Well, we're going to study under a microscope. And uh, everybody said, well, how do you do it? And he was like, you'll find out when you get there. So anyway, I w walked or ran immediately to my counselor and said, I think I'm going to switch majors. And he said, why is that? And I said, well, and I told him about the last slide. And he said, oh, yeah, okay, that could, that could be a problem. All right, so what comes with switching majors? A phone call home, self-doubt, and a lot of catch-up time. So, like I said, I didn't take any art classes in high school. So I felt like everybody that was two years into their art major was way ahead of me. Um, I called home, and fortunately, my mother was very open-minded about this because she was an artist. And they were shocked that I was changing majors. And she goes, well, what do you think you're going to do with that major? And I said, well, I'm going to get a job as an artist, you know, a, a commercial artist somewhere, hopefully. And she goes, well, you know, our neighbor is a commercial artist. And, uh, you know, I said, yeah, and he lives on the park, mom. He must do pretty good, you know, because he's right across from the park. So anyway, we had that discussion. And I was fearful of the catch-up time, right? I knew I was going to be working my butt off to catch up to everybody else, but it had to be done. The other thing is, I was at a four-year university. I didn't understand the difference between illustration and fine art. And our professors pushed the, for the fine art. They, they said, illustration, that's, that's minor league. You know, you, you don't want to think about that. You want to, you want to raise your, lo your lofty goals to fine art. Because, as my watercolor teacher told us, the artists are the minstrels of the rich. And so you want to, you want to focus your talent towards that community. I was like, wow, okay, that's one way to think about it. But I want to illustrate. So... We would have debates all the time. I, I finally fell into the fine art category and started doing fine art and started entering it in fine art contests and started winning awards for things like this. And I was like really befuddled because what, what is it about that that somebody saw that gave me a purchase award for that? I just didn't understand. I, I didn't get what I was supposed to be doing as a fine artist because I wanted to represent things. I wanted to create art that people could appreciate. And uh, I, I didn't get the fine art aspect. And when I, when I was there for, you know, the first year of my major, my junior year of college, I thought mm, maybe I should have, you know, switched to an art school so that I could learn illustration firsthand rather than trying to ride this out as a fine artist and then switching to illustration. So, you know, we all have our shoulda, woulda, coulda moments in life. And for me, I could have gone, you know, because it was right in my backyard in Chicago to the American Academy of Fine Art where this guy, Alex Ross, went, or this guy, Thomas Blackshear, went, or this guy, Hayden Sunbloom, went, or this guy, Gil Elfgren, went. But no, I went where this guy went. And I never saw him after I let him out of that jar. So, but the key to getting into the business was not through my major as much as it was through my minor. I found out that there was a minor program over in the, in the Industrial Education and Technology Department that had a graphics program where you could learn how to print, how to silkscreen, how to uh, create halftones, how to do four-color separation, um, all these behind-the-scenes things that I never knew about. But hey, if you minor in that, that might help you with your major. So I did. And that was the key that unlocked the door for me to get into the business. So my first uh, job out of college was working for in uh, point of purchase advertising. I got a job near my house for a, a very respected company in that, in that field. And the first things that I was asked, these, these questions up on the board are the first three questions that came up within the first two weeks of my employment. The first question was, where do you hang the broom? 
The second one was, why didn't you go to art school? And the third one was, you know, I can get you fired. So uh, those three questions were th thrown at me uh, in the first two weeks of employment. Where do I hang the broom? I don't even know what that means. I thought the guy, and he had a suit on, you know, he had a three-piece suit on, and he was older, and I'm like, I just looked at him, and I thought, wow, am I supposed to be sweeping the floor, too? I didn't know. And so I went home that night and said, hey, Dad, if somebody asked you, where do you hang the broom? He goes, he's asking you where you live. I was like, oh, I didn't know that. So went back the next day and told him, I live in Skokie. So um, I got that question answered. But the other two, why didn't you go to art school? Well, I was already where I was. And, and then that followed with, well, you know, I can get you fired because I didn't hire you, but you should have gone to art school like I did. I was like, oh, okay. But again, back to my minor, industrial education and technology, I ended up in the dark room. I ended up in the dark. Hey, how about that? Um, and, and I learned uh, about more about the darkroom experience, and, and, and that helped uh, because later I met Kevin O'Connor, and I call it the Kevin Connection. Kevin is also a very famous pinball artist that preceded me by about six months in the business. He called me. I, could, I worked with him in the point of purchase advertising company for about six months. He got a job at Bally, call it, you know, the... the the real Bally, you know, on Belmont Avenue in Chicago. And he called me six months later and he goes, they're hiring. Get your portfolio together. I can get you in here. I was like, okay. So um, I worked really hard for about three weeks and got an interview uh, with Paul Ferris. Um, Paul Ferris was the art director at Bally back when I joined them. And uh, he looked at my work and um, I... You know, it was mostly fine art, but I had done some special pieces that were more illustrative, something that would be more pinball dynamic. And uh, he looked at those, and he goes, you know what? I'm going to give you a test. I'm going to give you one week, and not the bare naked ladies version of one week, but I want, I want you to take one week and come up with something that looks like a pinball backlash. So I went back home and worked till three in the morning every night, got about four hours of sleep, went to my day job, and went home at night for a week and, and worked on summertime. Um, and it was, it was uh, you know, I didn't know what they were going to think of it. I just did it. It's, they didn't give me any direction. It was just like, do what you want, and, and that's what I worked on. Uh, interestingly enough, part of this inspired uh, Skateball later on, because Skateball was the first illustration I did for a back glass at Bally. And, and the van uh, is leftover remnants from, from uh, summertime that made it onto the back glass of Skateball. Um, and, and who knew back in the day, way before my time, that there was a summertime pinball machine. Um, so anyway, on 612, 1978, hey, that's like next week. Um, I landed the gig at Bally. Uh, and Bally became Bally Midway, and Bally Midway became Williams um, over the next 20 years or so, 21 years. Excuse me. So. Getting in Bally was important, obviously. Uh, and when I told Paul Ferris I had darkroom experience, he stood up out of his desk. He goes, why didn't you say that in the first place? And I said, well, I, I didn't know if it was going to be important here. He goes, I'm setting up a complete darkroom with a processor, film processor, and we're, we're going to keep a lot more of that work in-house. So you can help me set that up and get it up and running. And I said, yes, I can. So um, that's what really got me in the door at, at Bally. Um, but for, for the next 10 years or so, it was, I call it the, the first 
five years was like bally high for me. I was just on a, a complete high. Couldn't believe I was working next to guys like Paul Ferris and Dave Christensen. And, you know, just, just a, a kid, you know, just a couple years out of college and, and having the time of my life. Uh, it, was, it was so cool to be able to have the freedom to do kind of what we wanted to do at that time on themes that were, uh, some were licensed, like the Harlem Globetrotters and Rolling Stones, and others were just off the top of the head. So I put uh, Black Pyramid on here because up until Black Pyramid, um, that was the high part of things. That's, that's when things were on a roll, but slowly pinball declined and uh, we got into the, the lower portions. But I just want to go back to the art department. We've made, we, we stayed lifelong friends. Uh, Kevin O'Connor, Pat McMahon, Margaret Hudson, Paul Ferris. Um, it's like a fraternity that I never thought I'd want to be in, but I, I never was in a fraternity, but this is the best fraternity I could have ever been in. And, and we've remained good friends for, throughout the years. We just got together last summer with Tony Ramuni, uh, another you know guy that did the first Black Knight backlash and art package. Uh, he lives in back in Italy now, and uh, so we we still get together when we can and talk about the old days and talk about uh, new times too. Um, so I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna get to see Tony this week coming up. Um, the Bally Midway, I call this the the low period for me. Uh, again, these are my opinions, but it's when pinball started to wane and, and video games took off like a shot and then even video games started to settle down uh, with the advent of uh, laser disc games and all those fun things. So um, Black Pyramid was like a high point and then it kind of came down from there. Um, I've, I've mentioned this in other uh, talks. Hard body was not a happy moment for me. Hard body was forced upon me by corporate because Bally had just bought health clubs, Chicago health clubs. And Rachel McLish was the spokesperson for Chicago health clubs. And the, the guys were like, okay, the guys meaning the suits were like, okay, we're going to do a game that supports the health clubs. So we're going to do a weightlifting game, a, a bodybuilding game. And I was like, oh, really? And we're going to do a photograph on the back glass. Oh, all right. I, I fought it tooth and nail, but I lost. Um, but fortunately, it was the only photographic back glass that Bally ever did. So let's hear it for that, right? Thank you. Thank you. I'll take that. Um, but the other cool thing is, in this low period, I also met and worked with um, Dan Langloy. Dan was a young designer that was brought in to kind of shake things up and, and bring new ideas to the play field. And, and he did. And some were very experimental. Most were very experimental. So Black Belt, which I saw one here today, um, Strange Science, Lost, Escape from the Lost World, were all Dan Langlois games where he was really working outside the box and creating a, a new vibe for pinball. And it started, you know, because we were going up against Williams high speed. We had to, you know, battle uh, Steve Ritchie himself and come up with something that would grab attention uh, compared to what he was doing. Uh, so um, I thought Strange Science was interesting uh, and, and it got some attention at the show that it went to. And then the next stage of my career was Williams, uh, where um, this, this was a, a major, this was even higher than the Bally High as far as creativity. Um, this is where we really came into our own, and, and, and Williams gave a lot of freedom to the design teams. Uh, by br bringing the Bally team in together with the Williams team, it created a real rivalry. Uh, there was a lot of competition between teams. And it, it, was, it was a pretty cool work environment. Uh, the Ritchie brothers on one side and Nordman and, and every, you know, everybody else just you know, working together but working competitively to do the next best thing. 
um, Dennis and I kind of approached it like, hey, let's have fun with this, you know, let's, let's not be so serious, let's, let's really have fun with what we do. So games like Party Zone and Dr. Dude and the Elvira games, you know, we were, we were just having fun and, and I think it shows, you know, those games are unique to what they are, they weren't huge sellers at the time, but they, they were what they were and they've stood the test of time. I still get people coming up going, hey, Dr. Dude is just such a weird, amazing game. You know, thanks for, thanks for putting that thing together. Um, you know, I got to work with Steve on Star Trek Next Gen. I've talked about that before. Uh, that, that was where Steve said, I want to work with you, but I don't want any funny stuff on the game. So I said, don't worry, Steve. Star Trek is not very funny. Uh, and again, you know, lifelong friends. Uh, we, we built great relationships with each other and, and uh, you know, we got to meet famous people. Um, all was good. Uh, I, can't, I can't say enough about uh, everybody that we've worked with. And it, it is a team effort. You know, it's, a, it's always a team effort. Uh, this, is, this is another transitional period in my career. I call it Midway again because after Bally, or after Williams closed its pinball doors, I ended up at Midway doing touchscreen games, art directing for those, uh, and then I worked on two uh, Xbox and PlayStation games, one called PsyOps, The Mindgate Conspiracy, and the other was a uh, game with John Woo, uh, the famous film director, called Stranglehold. Um, each one of those games took three years in development, which was really outside the box, outside the, the thought of how fast games really should develop, uh, because in pinball, it takes about a year to develop, to develop a game. And to work on something for three years is extraordinary uh, and hard to fathom. Um, so that guy at the bottom there, that's a fish out of water. That was me. And then... Uh, Unemployment struck in 2008, and I was 50-something at the time with two kids in college, and I went to a resume-building uh, seminar at the library, and the 31-year-old guy, maybe, said, you, sir, are highly specialized, and I said, thank you, I realized that. So, so much for resume-building, right? He said, oh, by the way, you, you should only put the last 10 years on your resume. I said, what if I don't want to do what I did for the last 10 years? <laughs> I, <laughs> it doesn't work, you know? So anyway, it was time for reinvention. I came to Seattle, and the rest is history. I, I got together with Dennis. We created Woe Nelly. We met Jersey Jack. Uh, I worked with Jersey Jack on his first game. Uh, I... I you know, it's all been an amazing, serendipitous uh, path from, from here to there. But, you know, that's where I ended up as a freelancer, uh, working, working with Jack and a bunch of other game companies, um, and including Stern. I did, I did help Stern in the freelance era. But I also built the Wizbang company with Dennis, and Wonelli got us uh, at least a foot in the door back at Stern. Um, I'm going to show some stuff that I've never showed before. This is a beer label. Uh, one of our programmers uh, from uh, Williams, Tom Uban, uh, when he stopped programming, ended up working uh, or starting a brewery. Uh, and, and so he wanted to brew beer his whole life. And he took that opportunity and uh, created a brewery. And I started doing label art for him. So this is a more finished piece I did for a, a piece that he called First Ascent. His uh, avocation is rock climbing. He loves rock climbing. And so his whole uh, thing in starting this brewery was he wanted to give it a rock climbing theme. So First Ascent was his first uh, brew that he concocted, and I, I did the label art for it. And I handled it like a pinball back glass, but I forgot that the label was going to be that big. So there's a lot of detail on this thing. And, and I worked large enough that I could blow it up poster size, and you could see all that fine detail down on the ground there. But uh, it's, uh, I, I, I tackled it more like, like a uh, pinball machine. Probably shouldn't have. Um, 
I also did a rough sketch for him of a bunch of, a bunch of monkeys for a, ga a, a, a game, a beer that he called Rochambeau, which is rock, paper, scissors. Uh, and uh, so I did the monkeys, you know, see, hear no evil, see no evil, and turn them into Rochambeau. And I gave him a rough sketch, and he goes, okay, great, thank you. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. He goes, what? I said, I'm not done. Those are rough sketches. He goes, no, they're not. I'm going to print these. I said, no, you're not. And he goes, yeah, I am. And so my rough sketches became final art, which I wasn't a ha really happy about. But um, he liked it, so he was the client. And that was another lesson I learned in the freelance business. These are, uh, through Tom, I met another brewer, but she was brewing uh, liquor. She was a distiller. So um, she was out in Colorado. And her avocation was uh, um, whitewater rafting. Uh, so she, she wanted to develop her work based on whitewater and, and that kind of stuff. But she liked the pinball graphics, and she wanted to create characters that had a pinball vibe to them. So I worked with her for a couple of years. All right, so I'm going to take a real turn here. How much time do I have left? It's 4.14. I don't have much time, right? So um, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. But for the younger people out here, I do everything on a Cintiq tablet now. I take a stylus, and I work directly on a computer. And, and it creates the artwork that I, that I want to create, much like the artwork that I created before computers came along. So those are what we call real art tools. That is a myriad of brushes, pencils, magic markers. And by the way, magic markers were made out of a glass tube. And we learned from Paul Ferris the hard way that if you get mad enough at the work that you're doing and throw the magic marker against the wall, it will break and leave a nice color spot on the wall. So uh, we, we came in one morning and we were like, hey, Paul, did you have a bad night last night? And he was like, yeah, get out of here. Um, so anyway, we used real tools. Um, I put Lucy up here because this contraption was called a Lucy. And all it was meant to do was take a sketch. It was an opaque projector. You'd put your sketch up here. And if you wanted to enlarge that sketch, it would be projected down here. And you would retrace painstakingly the sketch onto tracing paper so that you'd have a bigger version of it. So we used Lucy's, um, and, and it all started with thumbnail, pencil thumbnails, and, and moving on to tight sketches, and marker comps, uh, so that eventually it would lead to Rubylith film and printing. Uh, that, that was all the stages. This is kind of a, you know, if you read down from the top, that's the stages of development that we go through. Um, so I'm trying to move this through this as quickly as possible. The Rubylith film, Rubylith was a substrate whereby you would cut with an a X-Acto blade and peel off what you didn't want to print and leave what you did want to print. And then that would be converted into a film positive, which would then be burned into a, uh, a silk screen, which would then be printed. Now, there's probably silk screeners out here going, now, Greg, that's not exact. Well, I, I covered that briefly just to get through this. But uh, it, it's a lot of work, and it's a lot of uh, effort by a lot of people. When I did Wonelli, I wanted to keep it true to the old school vibe, so I did it old school. I did each layer uh, as a separate color. So there was 11 colors on this, the Wonelli playfield that all had to register to each other and line up, so they all printed to make it look like a continuous image. Uh, illustrations with paint. We actually used paint with airbrushes and, and br all sorts of brushes. And uh, we, we also call this continuous tone, um, like a photograph. It's continuous tone, meaning that the color is, is full color. Um, and just to show you, when you go, when you take a walk out onto the floor out here, you'll see the older games are line art, you know, uh, a, an ink drawing filled in with solid colors or half tones of colors to create pseudo gradations. Uh, whereas a painting is reproduced photomechanically and printed uh, via a series of dots, CMYK, 
uh, cyan, magenta, black, and yellow onto whatever substrate you need to print it on. So I, I'm showing two pieces of my work that show off line art versus continuous tone or painting. S same with Paul Ferris. He did line art early on, and then he implemented uh, four color process onto our back glasses uh, and, and was able to convince the higher ups at Bally that we needed to do continuous tone to make our games look like they were album covers uh, rather than pinball machines. Wow, that doesn't make sense. Um, so here's just some views of Scared Stiff as thumbnails. You know, I got to start somewhere, right? And you just start putting ideas down on paper. Um, this is a pencil sketch that I handed off to uh, uh, John Yowsey to finish the back glass. So I designed the layout with the castle in the background, gave it to John, and we gave him a list of sight gags and said, have at it and make it cool, and he did. This is a, a tight ink drawing that I did for, uh, for um, Party Zone. And uh, with that, I did a comic book style of fill from, from that ink drawing and, and did a blue line transfer. This is another thing. Uh, you take your ink drawing, you give it to a company that does a blue line transfer, very, very much part of the comic book industry, and it leaves a blue line that doesn't get photographed, but you can paint right on top of that blue line and then marry it with the ink drawing. And that's, this is the comic book style color of the fill uh, that would then you know, be married to the, the ink drawing to create the final product for Party Zone. Um, sometimes I did pencil sketches underneath the painting to create value and tone and give me, myself a base to work from. Uh, illustrations with paint. This is uh, a lot of people feel this is uh, one of my best pieces and uh, thank you. I, I, it's, it's not the style that I use currently but uh, definitely I, was, I think I was maybe 26 when I did that so I've learned a few things. Uh, since then. Back in the day, stenciled cabinets. You gave uh, the stencil maker a piece of art that w they could then turn into stencils and spray paint on cabinets. Uh, Paul Ferris took that to extremes with the way he handled Centaur, uh, but by the time we got uh, into the 80s and 90s, we were able to, or actually closer to the 90s, we were able to uh, print directly on the cabinet with uh, maybe up to six colors, uh, line art, um, and then later on full color process uh, like Medieval Madness. Uh, we started using the Mac in the early 90s. There was one Macintosh in our, in our art department for a bunch of people, and we all um, got to share that one Macintosh to make sure that this was something that we should be investing in. Some of us were early adopters and others weren't. Um, so taking this to the extreme, my last piece of real art that I call real art was Revenge from Mars, the back glass. Uh, and my first all computer developed art was Wonelli. So um, that shows that computer developed art can look similar to real painted art. Uh, today's workflow. At, at, I'm currently the art director at Stern Pinball. So there are two in-house artists, myself and Stephen Martin. And um, my, part of my job is finding the right talent, getting the right guys attached to the right job. Um, I think we're doing OK so far in that department with guys like uh, you know, Chris Franchi and, and Zombie Yeti and Dirty Donnie. Um, who knew you had to have a stage name? Uh, I, I never acquired one. but. It's never too late. Maybe I'll come up with one. Uh, so Stephen Steve and, uh, and I, Stephen Martin and I, are kind of like tra traffic cops. And we just make sure the workflow continues, gets done on time, on budget, uh, and, and gets through the system. Um, this list of people in the middle are all the guys that have done work for Stern Pinball within the last year. Uh, part of that was because of Star Wars. Star Wars, we needed to get that job done on time, so 
Lucas stepped in and said, we can give you a list of guys that you can go to, and they're already sanctioned artists. We'll still have to approve their artwork when they're done with it, but at least it'll give you uh, more people to choose from. So part of my job as an art director is to make sure that the three games of Star Wars that we produced all looked like they came from one hand or one brain, and I hope... Uh, we were successful in that. I feel we were. Um, we had Bob Stevlick, our uh, uh, local artist in Chicago, did a great job of doing all the layout work for all the games, uh, including the play field. So I, I think Bob did a great job of dealing with the licensor and getting those rough layouts to a stage where they could approve it to go to final color. Uh, and then the other guys stepped in to do all the final color work, including Bob himself. Uh, this is a, just a picture we took at MGC last year. I call it the bullpen and the coach. So, uh, you know, the younger talent is, is there. They're happening. They're good guys. They know what they're doing. And uh, I just kind of coach them along and help them through any rough spots. Uh, so that's uh, Dirty Donnie and uh, Zombie Yeti, if you've never seen those guys before. Uh, Zombie Yeti, also known as Jeremy Packer. And that's Stephen Martin. Uh, not to be confused with Steve Martin uh, and myself having a beverage at uh, Expo a few years ago. Uh, Steve has been incredible. He's, uh, he's never seen, never been interested in pinball before, but he's fully developed into a, a great uh, production support artist, and uh, he gets a lot of stuff done on a daily basis. Anyway, I just want to thank you all for hanging out here and listening to this never-ending story. Um, I want to thank you for helping me uh, support my family throughout the years uh, because you're, you're the people that support the industry, support the game, and support the sport because it is becoming a sport. As we know, there's a lot of uh, competitors out there. So um, thanks to the Northwest guys that throw this show, Mike, for doing a great job here with the microphone and the video stuff. Uh, Jerry for getting me out here and doing the poster this year. Um, there are posters available out there. So um, if you got anything to sign, I can, I can take the time after this and uh, uh, sign anything you need me to sign. But thank you again. I really appreciate it from my heart. Thanks again. Any quick questions? Do we have time for like any quick questions if you got them? Five, five minutes. Right there. Go. Sure. Yeah. It, it, it varies. So the question was, uh, if you couldn't hear him, the, uh, is the storyline developed by the artist or by the, the game direction? Uh, and really, the, the, that changes with every game. Obviously, licenses are different. Licenses kind of drive the storyline. But, but the game team will, you know, like Dwight and Steve Ritchie worked with Star Wars to develop the storyline for the game based on the movies, of course. Um, but a game like Dr. Dude, uh, Dennis wanted to do uh, a comic book theme. He wanted to do uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. He wanted to get that license. And I said, uh, we could do our own, you know. So that particular game was driven by the storyline that, that I wrote for the idea of taking uh, – you know, a, a mashup of ideas, again, from my past, you know, the nutty professor and, and stuff like that, and turning it into a weird concoction of, you know, what it takes to be cool when you play pinball, you know. So, uh, you know, it, it's, really, it's really driven by each individual project. It's, it's, not a, it's not a hard and fast rule that the storyline is developed by the game designer or by the artist. It's, it's more, and especially in this day and age, it's more of a team effort. Way back in the day when the 
game designs came from game design and came to the art department and said, okay, they need artwork now, there was less interaction between the game designer and the artist, uh, especially, again, if there was a license attached. But, um, you know, like a game like Frontier, I'll use an example of one of my own games, our um, marketing um, chief was a woman that was married to the guy that photographed our games. She said, my husband is a dead ringer for, uh, um, you know, uh, Grizzly Adams. Uh, would you, could we do a game that's kind of a Grizzly Adams knockoff and, and create something with him on it? And so we talked about it and everybody agreed, yeah, he sure does look like Grizzly Adams. So he sent me all these gorgeous photographs of himself uh, on like a, a rig that made him look like he was up on a horse getting attacked by a wolf. And, uh, and I, I had great reference art to work from uh, and created, you know, the backlash from that. So, um, you know, there was a fact that marketing took an idea that was a knockoff of a potential license and we just turned it into something because her husband wanted to be on a pinball machine. So, anybody else? Yeah, you're welcome. One more. Right. Right. That's a complex question, but uh, in you know cur currently, um, our our screen graphics uh, need a lot more love than dot matrix. Uh, dot matrix. I'm not downplaying dot matrix because it's that was a difficult medium to work in, and guys like Mark Galvez and and all those guys did a wonderful job with what they had to work with, um, but but. People expect more now, um, you know, and 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 Jack made the first step into that realm, um, and and Stern has followed um, and and learned from. Uh, and I was there when when Jack started uh, the screen graphics, uh, and I I was instrumental in bringing uh, JP to the ta to 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 work for Jack, um, and JP has done nice work for him. Um, but uh, with that said, yes. Uh, we do much more sculpting work now for the toys. We, we uh, even back in the 90s, we had to bring in sculptors to, sculptors to, to work on the castle for medieval madness or the trolls uh, or whatever the case may be. We, we would do sketches and hand it off to a sculptor and they would have to work within the parameter of the mechanical engineer so that you know, it had to be cut this way. It had to be a facade here. You know, it had to cover this completely. And they would be given all those dimensions. Uh, and, and of course, now we've got, you know, 3D art showing up on screen, uh, not being driven as 3D art um, because uh, we don't have the processing power to do that, but being played back as an AVI or whatever the format uh, to create the illusion that, you know, um, Iron Maiden is a good example of moving in that direction. Um, so it is much more complicated now than it was in the past. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot more I could say about that, but, you know, I don't, I don't know if that really answered anything, but uh, we could talk about it later. <laughs> I, I think we're done. I think we're wrapped. So thanks again. Thanks for sticking around. <laughs>